have to quit now. Yeah. Okay, we're ready to go. All right. Um, so, could you tell me a little bit about uh, who you are and, uh, well, obviously uh, this is going to get a little bit confusing because you are, you were part of the Electoral Reform Coalition and now you work for the Electoral Reform No, the Commission. Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission. Yes. Okay. So, could you tell me a little bit about uh, who, uh, what, who you are and what you've done for the audience? Yep, sure. Um, my name is Helena Catt. I was one of the spokespeople for the Electoral Reform Coalition in 1992 and part of 1993, the two years of the referendum. I was involved in the Electoral Reform Coalition from 1990 when I arrived in New Zealand from the UK. The reason I came to New Zealand and my real job at that time was as a political scientist at the University of Auckland where my speciality is democratic institutions. So there was a close tie-in between my academic work and my political activities. So when I was spokesperson for the Electoral Reform Coalition, I also at the same time was doing quite a lot of media and talking to groups in my academic position. So the, the two did overlap. So I was doing a lot of work just explaining the different electoral systems, but always made it clear that I was advocating for one of them. Now, I'm Chief Executive of the Electoral Commission and part of our role is education and information on electoral matters, which includes the MMP electoral system. Okay. So I'll get you to look at Brian. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, thanks. So, um, probably you are, because you're, the Electoral Commission deals with education, you're probably the best person of all our interviewees to explain what the MMP system is. Okay. Um, under the, uh, the MMP system is a fully proportional system. MMP stands for Mixed Member Proportional. Mixed Member means there are two different ways in which Members of Parliament enter Parliament and the proportional is because it's a fully proportional result. So the number of MPs that each party gets in Parliament will be very close to the proportion of votes that they get um, and at the moment it's very close proportionately. In terms of the voters, what this means is that we get two votes. So our ballot paper has two columns on it. One lists political parties and you vote for the party of your choice. And the other column lists candidates for the electorate where you live and you choose the electorate of your choice. Uh, so that's what the vote has to do. Two ticks, one for a party, one for a candidate. The counting, all of the party votes are counted across the entire country. And we then determine which parties are going to be part of proportional allocation, which parties will get seats in Parliament. And there are two different ways that you can cross that threshold. One is to get 5% of all party votes, and the other is if you win at least one electorate. So once we know all the parties that have crossed that threshold, we apply the St. Legoo formula, which is the formula we use for proportionality, and that tells us how many MPs each of those parties will have in Parliament. So at this stage, we know the party makeup of Parliament. We know how many seats each party is going to get. What we don't know is which people are going to fill those seats. And as I said, there are two different ways that people come into those seats. The, um, one of the ways they come in is using those electorate votes. So in each electorate or district across the country, the candidate who got more votes than anyone else is the elected MP. So they go and take their seats in Parliament. And then for many parties, there will still be some empty seats. And those are filled up from people off the party list. Each political party nominates and publishes a party list before the election in rank order. And so what you do is we take the top people from that list who have not already been elected, because many candidates choose to be on the list and in an electorate. So if you've already been elected in an electorate, you're taken off the list and we've and the places are filled up um, from the list. Okay. So, <clears throat> could you tell me uh, uh, about, uh, about the Electoral Reform Coalition? Uh, who, who made it up? Uh, what, what was it like in those early days uh, uh, to fight for the uh, uh, for Electoral Reform? Oh, yeah. Um, the Electoral Reform Coalition was created when the Royal Commission report was published. That was in 1986. And uh, the group was created to campaign for implementation of 
all except one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission. The single recommendation they didn't back was a removal of the Māori seats, but the, everything else they were campaigning for. It was created by Phil Saxby, and it's a small organisation. As I said, I arrived in the country in 1990, so I really know about it from then. Um, it, even in 1990 and 1992, 1993, it was never a particularly big organisation, so it was done with a lot of time and energy from a small group of people with almost no money. There were key people in Dunedin, Christchurch, Wellington and Auckland and, some, and, and supporters in other places. Um, in each of the big cities there were a committee that did local work, there was an executive committee for the entire country which designed all of the campaigning. So all of the big campaigns and how it was conducted were decided by the uh, the central executive and the spokespeople came from the executive. So it really was, I mean, there were probably less than 20 key people who were very heavily involved and did most of the work. And you were one of them? And I was one of them, yeah. I was one of the, uh, one of the spokespeople and the deputy principal, uh, president for the North Island for a while. Okay. So uh, why did you personally join up? Um, I'd been interested in um, electoral system reform when I was in the UK. My doctoral thesis was on how people use their votes to get the best result that they can, so how people use votes tactically, and particularly um, the ways in which different electoral systems force people into tactical situations. So, um, in the UK with first past the post you get a lot of tactical voting because many people feel it's the only way they can get their voice over. So as part of that study, I had studied all of the different electoral systems and particularly looked at the extent to which uh, tactical voting by voters was necessary. Um, and so that, that was the basis of my interest in the impact of electoral systems and also my support for proportional representation systems as opposed to plurality. So when I came to New Zealand, in fact, it, even before I arrived in New Zealand, Phil Saxby, who set up the Electoral Reform Coalition, had contacted me. He knew I was coming to the country and he contacted me and said, you have to come and be involved in the campaign. Um, and so I did, um, because you know, I believe in proportionality and I thought it was a, a good thing to be campaigning for. Uh, under MMP, is there uh, more or less tactical voting under, than under FPP for Festa Post? Um, there's much, there's less. Um, the party votes, there are different kinds of tactical voting. Um, all party votes count, so party votes, really there's no need to be tactical. The only time when people are tactical is um, if you support a small party and the polls suggest it's going to get 3%, it's not going to win an electorate, so it's not going to get over threshold. You might at that point think, well, do I vote for my second choice? because this vote isn't going to work. But um, less than 3% of votes cast in our elections are cast for parties that don't get into Parliament. So there, there's not a lot of indication that there's a lot of support from the non-parliamentary parties anyway. Um, in the um, electorates, there's much less tactical voting than there used to be. It used to be this was your only vote. So. Uh, people would use it tactically to try and send their entire message. Now, really, you can send your message through the party vote. You do get uh, some people vote tactically. Uh, one third of people vote at what we call the split ticket vote, which means that the candidate they vote for is not from the party that they vote for. So some of that will be tactical, some of that will just be reflecting different views about which party I want and which local person I want to represent me. Okay. Um, what about, um, since I'm kind of going down this tactical path, uh, path, but in 2005, United Future and New Zealand First, most notably New Zealand First, promised that they would negotiate first with the party that got the most votes. How did that affect the uh, tactical voting uh, in 2005? Um, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of any research that's been done that's actually looked at that and it it's not I mean it, I haven't seen any of the surveys that really indicate accurately how much voters 
um, are looking at particular coalition deals when they decide how to vote. So, I mean, it's an area of search that hasn't really been done as well as it could be in New Zealand, so I don't know is the answer. I think you just gave me a thesis topic for my own doctorate, <laughs> actually. Um, but, um, oh, okay, uh, back to 1993. I'm just kind of following yep, tangents, sure. and I, I know it's going to sound disjointed, but... You'll put it back together yeah, again. Pretty much. The magic of technology. Magic of technology. Um, it, when you were in the Electoral Reform Coalition, did you at any time think you, you would succeed? Um, yeah, we were actually a pretty positive bunch, but I think that was as much to do with our personalities as, you know, any outside evidence that we were. I mean, it really was, we were the Davids fighting the Goliath. We were small, we had much less money. Um, most of the newspapers, particularly the editors, were opposed to change. Most of the politicians were opposed to change. Um, and it took a long time. I mean, it was a long campaign. The Royal Commission passed its report in 1986. We got our first MMP election in 1996. I mean, it was a long haul for a campaign with a small group of people. I think why we were all very positive is we all really believed in the rightness of the argument and also were very confident that most New Zealanders, if you explained the basic concepts and arguments to them, would also believe in it. So I suppose we had a very strong belief in our arguments and just incredible amount of optimism. And um, in retrospect, how successful was the Electoral Reform uh, Coalition? I don't think reform would have happened. We wouldn't have changed the electoral system if it hadn't been for the Electoral Reform Coalition. It kept the agenda. It kept the issue on the agenda. It kept asking questions. It didn't let it go away. I think otherwise, you know, four years after the report, everyone would have forgotten about it. And yes, it's another Royal Commission that nobody paid attention to. So, if for no other reason than keeping it on the agenda, I think it was very important. Okay. Um, do you believe that a similar grassroots uh, group would be able to successfully lobby for changes in America's system? I don't see why not. Uh, I mean, there are differences with the small country, big country. I mean. It was possible, some of the things that we were able to do in New Zealand with a small group of people were possible because New Zealand's a small country and therefore everyone has connections everywhere else. You know, they reckon there's one degree of separation in New Zealand. So it's much easier for a small group of people to, between us, to know journalists and politicians and activists and so on. So some of that, a small group can more easily get its voice heard in a wide range of places. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a kind of, there is a question of scale with the larger country, but I don't see any reason why the fundamental arguments wouldn't work um, in the States. Okay. How much influence do minor parties have in MMP? In Parliament? In government? Parliament, yes. Um, they do, ha they have some. Um, particular, you know, some of them, they, there are a variety of different arrangements that they have with government. Some of them are in full coalition, some of them are on... Um, agreements not to um, vote against the government on a no confidence or even the Greens at the moment just to abstain on no confidence. So I mean there are agreements made uh, but but you can you know you could probably count on the fingers of both hands the big things that have happened because minor parties have demanded them as part of coalition deals. So the vast majority of what happens is still what the largest party wants. You know, and so that you know, there's small things like there's the family commission and there's the um, retired person's um, saver card, which has just come out the gold card. Um, there's a buy Kiwi, you know, buy local projects uh, thing that's being advertised at the moment that the Greens wanted. I mean, there really are, you know, there's a small number of kind of headline initiatives which have been part of the deal. But day by day, week by week, mostly the large party, both now under Labour and formerly under National gets to do what it wants. It just has to talk to people a bit more. Okay. Um, it, uh, do, you, do you think that um, there are some minor parties that have a disproportional amount of power, too much power? No, not at the m I don't think that's been shown at the moment. I mean, there are some parties, New Zealand First at the moment, that has bo worked both with the right and with the left. But I, I mean, I don't think that's disproportionate power. They're, they're still getting votes from people. Yeah, they're still accountable to voters. Okay. 
Um, th that's another thing. Do you think MMP has made politicians more accountable to the voters? Yes, a small shift in votes can make the difference. I mean, less than a thousand, if, if fewer than a thousand people who didn't vote at the last election had all voted Green, the Greens would have got the last MP instead of National and we would have a different, you know, the Greens would have then had one more MP, they would have been able to form a coalition government with Labour. It would have been, a t you know, 800 votes could have made a really big difference if they'd all gone the same way. So parties are aware of that, really small shifts in the numbers of votes on the party vote can mean you lose a seat or gain a seat, and the parties are aware of that. That's actually kind of interesting because in 2005, I remember uh, that um, uh, Nandor Tanks, uh, Tank, Nandor, yes. whose last name is unpronounceable uh, to an American tongue, um, he, he didn't get into Parliament uh, originally because they, the Greens didn't get yes. the last MP. And then um, Rod Donald died. Rod Donald died, and he was the next person on the list. Yes. The Green Party is kind of ambivalent towards the legalization of marijuana, mm. uh, but Nandor has, you know, been noted by supporting. Yes. You know. If eight hundred more votes could have gotten the Greens into into to the last mm. MPC and formed a Labour Green coalition, mm. it, it, it's interesting that there were 5,000 votes for the legalized marijuana yes. party. And if the, uh, and perhaps, you know, there, there is uh, enough of a, 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 in that sense, uh, what's, your, what's your take on, on things like that happening? That, that you know, uh, that there's a lot of, I, I don't want to say luck involved, but, you know, it, it, this, this seems like for the want of a horseshoe now. Yes. That it is very, Yes, it's a small number of voters, and I think, and and while the political parties recognise that it's a small number of votes, I think there's still a lot of voters who don't realise quite how powerful their votes can be, and what a small number it takes to make a difference in the result. Um, so, so yeah, people definitely have voters here definitely do have power. Yes. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you live, under the first past the post, if you're one of only, you know, Greens for instance, we're talking about them, if you're one of only 10 Green voters in your area, you've got no chance of having your vote count. Under MMP, it doesn't matter where you live because all of the party votes are counted across the entire country. So you don't get geographic concentrations making a difference in the way that they do in first past the post. That's actually very interesting because, uh, as you know, I live in Austin. Uh, Austin is in Texas, Texas is in the United States. Uh, in Austin, Texas, um, where I live, basically what happened was that uh, my vote for president does not count mm. because I know that Texas will always go Republican. I'm not a Republican. Uh, I don't know if I'm a Democrat, but I'm not a Republican okay. right now. And I would, you know. um, my congressional districts, uh, Austin used to have, you know, competitive seats. Uh, that was changed in 2003-2004, uh, no, in 2002 and 2003 for the 2004 election, mm -hmm. so that it, 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 through gerrymandering it became less competitive and Republicans got more seats. Um, and so my vote for congressman didn't count, my vote for senator doesn't count, um, mayor, maybe. Um, and I like my congressman. I live in a district which happens to be a democratic safe seat, but it's still a democratic safe seat. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I'm making this documentary is because, you know, there is the whole idea that my vote as an American doesn't actually hmm. do anything. Okay. Yeah. Very different in New Zealand? Yes. I, I also, but that also brings up a different point. There used to be safe seats, the similar problem under uh, first past the yes. post, where people felt that they, yep. um, you know, why you, bother? Yeah, you know you, who's going to win, right? But under uh, MMP, there are situations where there are politicians who probably would not uh, have won uh, an electoral seat, probably would not have gotten uh, the support they need, either because they they're unpopular or they're not. Uh, a good campaigner who are high up on major party list seats, and I'm thinking about, and I'm not saying this disparage of hmm. Dr. Don Brash in uh, the National hmm. Party. 
he was brought in despite ha having never, I believe, run for a mm -hmm. seat. At the, at the list number five, he yep. was brought in for his expertise mm -hmm. and put into a position where he would be guaranteed a, 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 a seat. And I think that was part of um, how they recruited him. But I I isn't that a little undemocratic also itself? Or? Um, but we still, as voters, we know who's on the list. Everyone contemplating voting for National knew that Don Brash was number five on the list. That really concerned them. It should have been one of the things that they took into account when looking at the list. Um, you know, so it, it's not kind of hidden people. We do know who they are. They are published beforehand. Um, the media tends to give some attention to particularly who's in the top 20 of the lists or who they think might get in. So we do know about it. Um, they're selected by party members. So there, you know, there's some internal democracy involved there. And it's really no different from the candidates that we get in the electorates. They also are chosen by the political party. You know, so I don't get to choose who my candidate is from each party inside my electorate. The party chooses. Likewise, the party chooses the list. So I just have to take that information into consideration when I think about who I want to vote for. And there are a lot of jobs inside Parliament where your ability to go round and open school fates and, you know, talk to people is not necessary. Yes, we need representatives who are going to connect with the people, but we do also need people inside Parliament who have other kinds of expertise. And uh, Margaret Wilson, our current speaker, is another good example. I mean, she was brought in on the list because, you know, for the same kinds of reasons that Don Brash was, although a different area of expertise. Michael Cullen, our... Uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister doesn't contest the electorate, he only contests the list. Again, because he, you know, he has a lot of work as a minister and whilst he has been an electorate MP in the past, it was deemed that his, ex, you know, his, his skills best lay elsewhere. The, um, what about the <coughs> idea of the, of the American spoiler vote? Uh, people in 2000 in Florida who voted for Nader. Hmm. Does that happen here? Um, because you only, because you need, if you get over five percent, you start getting into Parliament. It, much less so. So you'd have to be, if you really did a spoiler vote, and one assumes people do spoiler votes, well, th that they can have an impact. And here they, they don't. They don't have that negative impact because if enough people vote for that party, then the party gets MPs. Um, what you do get less of is people kind of making a protest vote, so voting for somebody who they don't actually want to get elected, because it's a bit risky, because if 5% of the population have the same idea, these people get elected. I, I did notice the McGillicuddy Serious Party yes. died, Good example. Out, yeah, died out around the time the MMP was introduced. Yes. They got really close. They got over 4%. Their first election, they got over 4%. Most people who voted for them didn't, you know, it was a protest vote. They didn't really want them in. That was a bit of a shock to the party as well. It was kind of, ooh, we might actually have got elected there. We weren't, yes. So they, you know, under first past the post, there's a real role for a kind of protest party that isn't going to get elected. McGillicuddy thought it was a bit dangerous under MMP that they might get elected. So, so... We don't have M we don't have Miguel Cuddy series no. today because, um, but uh, but also the uh, the whole idea is that um, people voting for Nader it, it wasn't just a protest vote mm. it was that there were policies involved yes. that were closer mm. much closer to the Democratic uh, Al Gore's policies than there than there were to mm. uh, George Bush's and. Um, even more so now, because he campaigned on a completely yes. different platform. But um, uh, George Bush, I mean. Uh, and, and the thing is that under that system, it seemed like people who voted for Nader... Could have lost out got the presidency. Right. But people who, who want labor as their second choice and vote Greens, are they costing labor anything? Um, it, it may have been a bit of a gamble at the last election. Uh, some of the people who voted Greens may have assumed that they would, you know, that a Labour-Green coalition is what would happen, and it didn't happen. So, yes, that may have been a danger for for some of those people. But even if those people had voted Labour, the total of number MPs from Labour and Green would still have been one shot of what was needed to form a government. Uh, so, so voting 
labor or our voting rights didn't really help national. No. Um, um, how do you feel that the um, that the multi-party system, the MMP system, has affected the electioneering of uh, the two major parties? Um, they do it everywhere now. So they used to campaign in the marginal seats and pretty much ignore both their own safe seats and the opposition safe seats. So the campaign used to happen in just a few parts of the country. Now it happens everywhere because one votes, one vote. We don't, you know, they don't care where it's from in the party vote. So yeah, that's made a big difference is that everyone sees the campaigning everywhere. There has been some change in terms of talking about who they might go into coalition with, but that's been different at each election, the, the pattern that that's taken and, and, and how that's been viewed. And as I said earlier, it's still not clear that the, what impact that has on voters. Um, so, I mean, I would say those are the main changes in campaigning. We haven't yet had a lot of negative campaigning that might change in the next election. Uh, do you think negative campaigning has uh, changed uh, more or less since uh, before, uh, since MMP was introduced? I don't, no, I don't think so really. Um, there were, there were some important negative comments made at the last election, but I think it was more there were a few comments that got a lot of coverage as opposed to a big increase in the total amount of negative campaign. Okay. Um, do, do you think that uh, the two major parties have become more centrist now that there are parties on, uh, on the right of, uh, of national and on the left of labor on most issues? Uh, obviously that's not, that's an oversimplification. Mm. But do you think having those other parties representing other interests in the parliament, has that enabled them to be more centrist and uh, maybe, or, or maybe more flexible? Uh, how, how has it changed uh, how they uh, choose their policies? Labour became more centrist before MMP came in. I mean, 19, you know, the 1980s Labour government that brought in all the monetarist policies was where the big shift in Labour was across the ideological scale, so that that predated change in the electoral system. And at the moment, I mean, Labour has been adopting a large number of the Green Party policies. So no, it's not clear that the may and ACT, uh, National Party has totally taken over Act's platform. You know, Act almost has nothing that it can distinguish itself with anymore. So. No, I don't think the the major parties are leaving the fringes to their small parties. They're still trying to be the large catch-all party. So yes, they've moved to the centre, but they haven't given up the extremes. I think they're just still very broad parties. Uh, do you think that's uh, from a uh, from a practical standpoint for for getting the best uh, the most votes in your coalition and leading a government? Do you think that's the the best uh, tactical response, or do you think they're kind of missing that? Or um, I, th I mean, I think what we're seeing is still very much transition because m many of the senior people in both political parties entered politics under first past the post. So we haven't yet got the parties being led by people who have always been political under the MMP environment. So we're still there's still a lot of first past the post thinking there. And, and, and not everything changing in terms of what you might most sensibly do under MMP. Uh, but uh, as for the electorate, most, uh, in 2008, most people who vote for the first time will yes. you know, vote, have voted only under MMP. MMP yes. Do you think that uh, 15 years later that, they, uh, that New Zealand's electorate really understands the system, really understands how, how powerful their vote is? Um, they understand a great deal about it, yes, we do, at the Electoral Commission we do surveys um, before and after each election and in the middle of each election cycle asking them basic questions about the electoral system. Uh, mostly they do understand the key components, they understand the importance and the value of their party vote and also it would be particularly amongst, there's a big age difference in belief in proportionality, belief in diversity. So the younger voters, they very much believe in all of the things that proportionality gives you. The older voters, many of them, are still 
believe in strong government, you know, strong single party government, the things that they were used to under the old system. So, but yes, there, there is good understanding, but it is generational, it's what people are used to. Um, do you think that uh, when people uh, vote in an MMP election on the party vote, which is mm. for the makeup of parliament the most important yep. vote, do you think people are, who, when they vote for that party vote, are voting for the people in the party or for the policies of the party? Are they voting for the personalities or the ideas? Um, a mix. I mean, the, the personality of the party leader is very important for many people. Who that person is personifies what the party is. And so the campaign between the party leaders is very strong and most of the televised debates between the party leaders. So quite clearly that does have an impact. But the policy stance of the party is also very important. And um, some of the work we've been doing trying to find out why a lot of young people are not voting, a lot of them say they're just totally daunted by how do you assess the policy position of 14 parties across 10 issues you care about. So, which really indicates that a lot of young people in particular are wanting to make their decisions based on policy. They just find that whole idea of how you do it. So I think what has happened is that the language of ideology, of left and right and centre and you know, environmental parties, Christian parties, whatever, that language is no longer the mainstay. And so, you know, well, when I was growing up anyway, you know, all talk about politics was within the ideological spectrum. So if you knew where you were on the spectrum, you knew which two or three parties you chose between. That language and understanding doesn't seem to be very strong at the moment, and I don't know why. Uh, but, but is that an improvement? No, I think it's much easier when people understand the spectrum. People, I mean, if people are being put off voting because the whole choice seems daunting, then you need shortcuts. And, you know, if parties truly do hold ideological space, then that is the easiest shortcut for deciding either where you do want to vote or who you definitely don't want to vote. I mean, if all you know is you don't want to vote for the right, then at least that cuts down the number of parties that you've got to look at in detail when deciding who to vote for. Um, let's see. Uh, is there more grassroots political partici participation in New Zealand now? No. No? Uh, do you think, uh, does that, did that surprise you? No, I mean, I think it's, uh, we're following international trends. You know, people are less involved participating less everywhere in all, in all the developing democracies. I mean, our voting turnout is still high internationally, but I think we're just suffering from what all the other developed democracies are. And uh, do people are busy doing other things. Uh, do, you, uh, do you have a theory of why? Um, I mean, I, th I think partly it's... Partly there's the globalisation thing. I mean, I think a lot of uh, young people young people in particular, but a lot of other people, think that more and more of the issues they care about are not solved by the government, they're solved globally, and therefore why be involved in national politics, and, and the way in which you're involved in international politics is quite different. Um, and also I just think, you know, changing lifestyles, decline in social capital means people do things collectively less than they used to. You were talking uh, about the decline in social capital, yeah. that's like... Uh uh, are you talking about the Putnam uh, stuff? Putnam stuff, yeah, yeah. Bowling alone, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, so we're less connected to a wide group of people. People are more, you know, a small, people do things with a small group more and more. There's less of that interconnections across uh, social divides. Our, our horizons, or many people's horizons, have become much smaller. Do what's good for your family as opposed to a broader. Uh, looking at what's important for the community. Or quite interestingly, your family or the, or the world. It's this kind of, you know, I mean, that global thing is still there. Um, but there, I mean, there are also less things to be involved in. Political parties don't use party members like they used to. A lot of campaigning is done electronically. You can talk to each other about politics over the internet. So why meet with people? You know, but all of those things change how we interact with people and with how much we participate in things. Okay. Um. Back to 1993, uh, when um, you know when there was the 1992 referendum, mm. uh, were you? Uh, how, how did you feel when you heard the results of the 1992 referendum? Very excited. 
they were great. I mean, we were, we were very, very pleased with them. Uh, did it exceed your expectations? Um, I can't remember. I think I, I mean, I think mostly we just as long as we you know as long as we won. That had been our main goal to win, rather than having any particular numbers in mind. Do you remember where you were uh, in 1992 when you heard the election results come in? Yeah, I was in the television New Zealand studio being interviewed about it. <laughs> did, did they tell you on air, or how did, how did you find out? We had computer screen. I mean, we had screens in front of us which had the results showing. So yeah, we saw them. I mean, they, they the cameras were on us as we were watching. I'm sure, but. Yeah, we were being interviewed on it. Was that 92 or 93? 92. Uh, where were you in 93? In 1993, I was at the uh, Electoral Reform Coalition Party, which was held in the Trade Union Centre. Okay. And um, uh, what was the reaction from everybody when the final results came in? Um, uh, we were pretty sure we were winning before the final results came in, so it had been a kind of building excitement. But a lot of excitement, um, also a lot of relief. It's like you know we can we can stop all this work now. You know we don't have to go and battle for another three years or try and keep the issue alive. So yeah, I mean a lot of excitement, but of, you know it's kind of the exhaustion can hit in now. We've won kind of thing. Okay. And um, how did you uh, were you surprised when um, when Peter Shercliffe and the campaign for first pass uh, no, sorry, the... Uh, campaign for Open Government? Yeah, CDG. Uh, were you surprised by their reaction? Did you did you expect uh, opposition? Um, we expected opposition. We didn't know that's where it would come. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know Peter Shercliffe existed until they started campaigning against us. Why do you think they did? I don't know. Never really understood that as to why they were so fearful. And fear did seem to be a large part of the emotion behind what they were doing. And it really was. I mean, mostly most of the interviews, or every, I think every time that I debated them, it was either him or his daughter. That is a, a, a good point. You debated them on air in 1993. Yes. And, oh, sorry. Yeah, let's... So you, you debated them on air in, in 1993. And, uh, what were your thoughts at that at, at that time, sitting sitting next to him? Did you learn anything more about where he was coming from, or? Um, I also debate. I mean, I debated him in a number of meetings as well. There were quite a few venues, you know, where groups, uh, Rotary, for instance, invited both of us along to debate. So th that TV one wasn't the first time I debated him. Um, my overriding impression of Peter Shirkliff is what the, he always just reminded me of my grandfather. You know, that generational difference, very much a kind of old-fashioned, traditional gentleman with money. I mean, you know, funny things like he would always call me Dr. Cat. I always called him Peter Shirkliffe. He always called me Dr. Cat. So, you know, I mean, and he couldn't stop himself. Every time he used my name, he emphasised my, you know, my additional credibility as an academic. And he couldn't bring himself to not do it. I mean, you know, it was really interesting, that kind of... Um, very old-fashioned, uh, old-time ge uh, you know, gentleman, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Do you think that uh, his main concern was, uh, I know that you mentioned that there was a lot of fear, but do you think that, the, that it was a personal fear uh, and that he really thought it was a bad idea, or do you think he was looking out for his business interests? That was never really clear from how he spoke. I mean, he cl he, his greatest fear was coalition government. But I never really understood why he feared it so strongly. Um, you know, he never, and you know, and hearing his debates over and over again, I still never really understood them. They never, there was never the depth there that led me to understand why he was so fearful of coalition government, other than just it's something you should be scared of. You know, in the classics, you know, I mean, he was always doing the look at Italy, look at Israel, which is just such a well, yes, that's your first line of argument. You really should have moved on to more complex arguments. And he and never Israel, did. And Israel and Italy didn't have a mixed member proportional no. representation system. No, they had proportional systems, and you know, and there are very good other reasons as to why they constantly had coalition governments. So no, it was ne you never got um, very sophisticated or complex arguments from him. It was very much a 
you know, yes, I can scare a whole part of my audience by just saying coalition government, and that was enough for him. Well, well there was a, a position paper that came out that uh, said that uh, tactically that the best way to go forward uh, was to sort of not debate on a high level mm. and to kind of uh, basically scare mm. uh, people who, you know, were... Yeah. And the adverts did that, you know, the crying babies. I mean, adverts were crying babies on an electoral system. You know, the um, MPs with the brown paper bags over their heads. Yes, all of the adverts they ran, it was all scare tactics. But it was mostly reminding people of inherent fears that they had anyway. And uh, but the, so they weren't like making an argument; they were just, you know. This is scary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty much it. Yeah, and a few, you know, key words, coalitions, faceless politicians. You know, they were pushing buttons. Um, do you think that though, in the end, and I, we spoke to uh, a journalist, Nikki uh, Hager. Okay. Yeah. Um, he said that he, um, one of the reasons why he joined up m rather later, but one of the reasons he joined up was because he was getting these wall-to-wall uh, -wall television advertisements mm. against MMP, and that it was kind of overkill. Do you think yeah. that they, they overplayed their hand and that yes. they, they, it was really counterproductive at the end? Yeah, and, and because we didn't have money for TV ads and they had lots of money, and that in the end was in our favour. You know, and so and we made you know we made sure people knew about this that this was the big business spending their money against us poor normal people who were just arguing the good argument. And so yeah, people, there were people who didn't there were voters who didn't like that, and that did help in the end. And in 1992, a similar thing happened in that a lot of the senior politicians said a change of electoral system will be awful, and it was almost like any time anyone had them said that, another 2,000 voters decided to vote for change. So in both cases there was a real backlash against who was doing the campaigning. Did, and I have to ask this, uh, did, the, uh, did the lobbyists for MMP really, uh, did they have buttons to push to? Did, did you? Oh yes, yeah. fairness. New Zealanders are big believers in what's fair, so yes, the fairness word was used a lot. Diverse Parliament was used a lot. You know, 1993 was the centenary of women getting the vote. You know, proportionality, you get more women in Parliament. That was an easy one to do because it was the, you know, it was one of the big talk, you know, there were things happening all over the country to celebrate for a whole year. Things happened across the country to celebrate the centenary of the women's vote. So yes, keying into that, that we get more women in Parliament, New Zealanders believe in fairness, you know, centenary, you know, giving them the vote early was an indication of that. So yes, you could really plug into the New Zealander self-image of fairness being very important. Um, could I ask a couple of questions about that? Yep. Do you think there was any stage where Peter or Janet Shirts have sort of felt that their views had been vindicated in any way? They probably still do. Um, most, as far as I know, a lot of the people who think who thought coalition government was awful, still think coalition government is awful. I don't think, you know, for a lot of them that view hasn't been changed. And where are the, where are the shirtless today in terms of public prominence? Nowhere, that I know. I mean, I assume he's retired, I have no idea what she's doing. Uh, Jim Bolter actually mentioned to us that uh, under MMP, uh, he, now he was opposed to it, but made it happen, yes. Yeah. Interesting. So they, well, what do you think that, that, that happened? Were they forced into it? or? Um, I mean, a lot of it came down to Doug Graham, who was the Minister of Justice at the time. Uh, that government broke a lot of its election promises. Why it kept one of the promises that it didn't want to keep, I don't know. Um, and I think, and then once they decided to keep it, they set up a very fair and independent system. And I think a lot of that's just down to the integrity of Doug Graham. Uh, even though there were two uh, elections instead of one? You, you, two referendum? Two yeah, referendum. I think, I mean, I, that was okay. We never had, electoral reform coalition never had an issue with that. Um, it would have been nice to go straight to one, but, you know, two lots of education was probably a good thing. And the government put the money in and set up an independent committee and did it very fairly. I mean, they didn't abuse their power. Even though Doug Graham, you know, who was overseeing it, didn't believe in it. Jim Bolt, the Prime Minister, didn't believe in it. They set up a fair system. 
Um, yeah, and you know, Doug Graham had a lot of integrity as the Minister of Justice, but why they kept that promise, I've never really understood. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the greatest uh, benefit to come from MMP? Um, I think our Parliament is now representative of the country, both in both in terms of social divides, but also in the range of political views. And Parliament has a larger role than it used to. It's not, you know, the government used to be able to control things. There are now things that Parliament can do as well as government. So Parliament looks more like the country. And when you're and talking about uh, government, you're talking about the, the elect executive. The executive, yes. Yes, yeah. so the cabinet, yeah. So, you know, and on the first past the post, if your party's the biggest one, then what your party leaders decide to do, the party follows on, that's it. Now, because you have to put together, you know, you've always got to put together the votes to get it, um, the select committees that consider bills are much stronger, they can make changes. Government can't guarantee to win every vote anymore. And they do lose some of them. So Parliament broadly now has more power than it used to, and that was one of the things that the Royal Commission wanted. Um, but also the diversity. I mean, you just... You, know, you talk to the guides who take people around Parliament, they say one of the things that almost you know, every tour group they take through comments on when they walk down the corridor that has a picture of every Parliament. You know, and it's suddenly it stops being all men and it stops being all older people and suddenly it becomes there's an age range and there's a colour difference and there's more women and they look more colourful. And that I mean, you know, if you want a visual image of what MMP's done, that's it. We have a parliament that more people think looks like the country. We definitely need to, need to go to Parliament to get that <laughs> shot. Um, so, uh, coming back to reality, uh, um, and, and actually that's a bad turn of phrase, I shouldn't use that phrase, because I asked you what the single greatest benefit was, now I kind of have to ask you the single greatest drawback. Back. And stuff. Uh, so, so what has it been, do you, do you think? I don't really think there has been one. And I'm not just saying that because I campaigned for it. I mean, I truly think that, you know, I have no problems with coalitions. I think it's a good thing that sometimes government has to negotiate and talk before. I mean, I suspect that's what many people would say is the problem, is that law sometimes takes longer and you have to negotiate. I think that's a good thing. Um, in 1996, in the first MMP election, were there any surprises that you, that you didn't expect that this was how MMP would really play out? Um, I think there were clearly some voters who didn't understand the role of the two votes, and there was some parties campaigned as if you used as if you should use your two votes to vote for the two parts of the coalition that you wanted, and some voters did that, particularly between Labour and the Alliance, and that's not how the system works. So I was surprised, particularly because the Alliance was one of the parties where they were all campaigning for MMP, so it surprised me that there were people there both campaigning and voting who clearly didn't understand the system uh, properly in terms of how you might do it. I think that was the, the biggest surprise, really. Do you think that, um, the, the, how long did it take before politicians started to understand MMP? Different parties did it at different speeds. I mean, there, is, there are those who say that the National Party still doesn't understand it. I mean, there's a lot of criticism of the last campaign by National was that it was a first-past-the-post campaign and not a, a MMP campaign. Can I get a new tape off you, please? Sure. If I have one, I'm probably, I mean, I definitely have one in my book bag, I just don't. Ah, here we go. Right. Are we uh, almost ready to go? We're rolling. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, we're also putting this in the film archive, and so that entire banter was just, you know, uh, was just taken through. Um, so, uh, so in 1996, uh, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you is uh, New Zealand First mm -hmm. uh, in 1996. Going back, looking, uh, it seemed like everyone we talked to said that they were surprised that New Zealand First eventually went with National. But mm -hmm. when you know, when I go back and then I look for statements from Winston Peters and from New Zealand First, they play their cards very close to their mm -hmm. chest. Do you think they understood MMP first uh, of all the politicians? Um, one of the first, yes. I mean, some of the other small parties did as well. But yes, they really understood it. And I think a lot of the, you know, the, the reconstructed memory of that negotiation was most people, it was, it was unexpected because it was disappointing. You know, 
so most of the people who were surprised were people who would back Labour, and therefore it was they were upset as much as they were surprised because they had wanted to believe that he would go with Labour as opposed to National. Uh, and is there, is there a problem? No, that was fine. Okay. And um, do you think that um, Winston Peters did say that he he campaigned for MMP also? Uh, since uh, 19, uh, 1993. Did your paths cross a, a whole lot? Not that I can remember, no. No. I, I mean, there were a whole lot of people, and particularly MPs, who were campaigning in their electorates and so on, as opposed to being involved in the Electoral Reform Coalition. I can't, I don't remember um, being at anything that Winston Peters was at, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, what, what modifications have been s suggested to the MMP system? Um, changing the threshold. Um, two possibilities. One is uh, changing the number, changing 5%. The other is removing the fact that you can cross threshold by winning one electorate seat. So th the suggestion is that if you win one electorate seat, like Bonnie Hyde did this time, he gets the seat, but he doesn't become part of the proportional allocation. Um, that's the that's the one that's been talked about the most. There are the other change that was suggested at the time the law was being passed, and there are still. I mean, it gets brought up every so often. Is having open party lists so that voters can. So at the moment, we just accept the rank order that the party puts in the party list with an open list. Voters could indicate which of the people on the list they thought should be at the top. It, it does seem a little bit weird that uh, a party can get 2% of the vote, but because they got an electorate seat, they can get into Parliament where a party that got 4% of the vote can't. Yes. Um, so do you, uh, do you see that as a flaw, or do you think that the regional representation really does require, uh, require that? It reflects the strong traditional belief in regional representation. I mean, that's why it's there, because... It, you know, it, it relates back to the first past the post assumptions that your representative has to be, you know, or that geographical representation is really important. I think that's why it's still there. Uh, in today's political context, and I'm talking very broadly, is geographical representation really as important as ideological representation? For many people, it is. Yeah, I mean, it, clearly, there are a lot of people who still think geographical representation is all important. Um, why MMP and not single transferable vote, which was in use in the Commonwealth at the time? Um, you mean why did the Royal Commission back it? Well, not just why did the Royal Commission back it, but why did the uh, campaign for a, 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 why did the electoral, electoral reform, reform coalition backed whatever the Royal Commission said? So, I mean, the Royal Commission said MMP unanimously, and quite clearly. The electoral reform coalition was created to put into place what the Royal Commission said. And in many ways, I think that was a real, in terms of winning the campaign in New Zealand, it was a real advantage to New Zealand that no pressure group existed before the Royal Commission. Because in places like the UK, there's been a pressure group backing single transferable vote for over 100 years. And so if they were to have a Royal Commission that, you know, that came out not for STV, and they've had you know, the Jenkins report and so on, the, there are different pressure groups who fight amongst each other about which system's best, as opposed to uniting to fight for change. In New Zealand, there was no group before the Royal Commission, so the uh, one and only group that came into being pushing for change backed what the Royal Commission wanted. So, there were, it, so it stopped division amongst those who wanted change. So if someone wanted to uh, bring MMP to, say, America, or a state in America, yeah. Do you think that the, and the, there is no uh, electoral reform uh, background, uh, no real grassroots groups hmm. for them? I mean, there's fair vote, but that's very, very yes. obscure. Um, do you think that um, one of the first steps would be to see if they should go to their state representatives and get a, com get a commission going to examine all these? Uh, yep. Or a citizens' assembly, as they've done in BC and Ontario. Uh, and, and, and because, it, well, in both cases, what the group asked, tasked with the job does, sensibly, is set up some criteria. 
you know, a good electoral system for us meets these criteria. And the, uh, the New Zealand Royal Commission's criteria are now used internationally as being a good set of criteria for an electoral system. But in the case of both British Columbia and Ontario, once they had decided what their criteria for a good electoral system was, they had no other choice of electoral system than the one each of them chose. So Ontario chose MMP and um, British Columbia chose STV. I mean, that's, you know, there are, you're talking as academic now, you know, there are a range of different electoral systems because there are different beliefs in what a winner is. And once you've worked out what you think a winner is and what you think is most important, then the answer as to which electoral system fits that is quite an easy one for academics who know about the electoral systems. It's getting agreement on what do we think is important. And so in New Zealand, the key thing that the Royal Commission said was we think there should be some geographic representation but we think fairness between political parties i.e. proportionality is vital. At that point they were going to choose MMP. Um, in British Columbia they put much more they really downplayed the role of political parties and put a lot of emphasis on every MP having a connection with their electorate. At that point STV is pretty much where they're going to go. So that is the debate that actually has to happen um, so that everyone's then on the same track once there's agreement on what it is you want out of your electoral system. Okay. Um, there was a push for MMP in Ontario. That failed. Yes. Why do you think that happened? Um, it was done way too fast with far too little information. Education. I mean, we had over a year of education twice. It's a... Electoral systems are something most people don't think about. Most people don't think about the electoral system they use. For the vast majority of people, they don't even know that there are different electoral systems. We have an election, we do it this way, that's how you have elections. You know, it's like suddenly suggesting that there's a different way of playing hockey or something. It's like, you know, this is the way you do it. So for most people, it's like nowhere near top of mind that you even think about how you do it. And so you need a lot of, you know, to get people thinking about, well, what we might think about, you know, it's kind of, we've got democracy, it's fine, what are you worrying about? I just think you need a lot of education and information to get people into even the position where they can start thinking about, is the change a good idea? Um, and because we had a year of it twice with our two referendum, most people were really informed on what they were doing. Ontario did it incredibly fast and, um, you know, most of the voter information was, this is where you go and this is how you fill in the ballot paper, as opposed to these are the fundamental ideas behind the system and why you w might want to look at it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, that's going to be a problem. Okay. Um, no, it's a technical oh. issue. But uh, so, do you think? Uh, uh, do you think there really are, uh, as many people have described, uh, in the MMP system? Uh, the possibility of kingmakers, uh, as Winston Peters has been called in the media a number of times. Basically the idea that the guy who comes in third determines who comes in first. Um, I think the last election indicates that that wasn't the case, because the Greens came in third, and, and what other parties said ended up having a big impact. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's for a short time. You know, yes, there's negotiations, but no, I think the role of some of these people is played up by the media. The majority of our media, the majority of our editors are still opposed to MMP. The majority of, you know, the majority of editors in 1992 and 1993 opposed MMP. A lot of those people are still in important roles in the media, and a lot of our media coverage is still anti-MMP because of that. Uh, what about the, uh, the listing? They ran a huge... Uh, they were pro, well, yeah, they were pro MMP. Yeah. Uh, and, and what is the position of the listener uh, in New Zealand media? Um, it's read by what in the UK you'd call the chattering classes. I, I have no idea what the chattering okay. classes are. Uh, journalists, academics, bureaucrats, the media, oh, so the people who talk for a profession. Would it be fair to say that it's kind of like the New Yorker? Yes. Okay. So like that kind of a Yes. Um, the liberal left. Yes. Okay. Um, do you think MMP would work in the United States? I think it would. Um, it would. It, they would. <coughs> it would take a shift in perceptions. 
but I see no reason why it wouldn't work there. Um, and particularly, you know, it's such a diverse society, and MMP is, I mean, one thing MMP is very good at is, is representing diverse societies and, and allowing different voices to be part of the whole. Um, but I think a lot of it, it, it depends on how people think about democracy. And so, you know, so a lot of it's to do with attitudes and history. I mean, if, you know, if everyone believes that democracy is how we do it now and therefore anything, any change means it's less democratic, then that's just a really hard fight. But an awful lot of, you know, how many, how many new migrants come into, or how many adults in uh, the States have been adults somewhere else? Probably they're somewhere else, they've been adults, they voted using a different electoral system. So there will be a lot of people in the States, who either themselves or their parents, or relatives still in other countries, use a different electoral system now. So I mean, there, there is some opportunity of this kind of, like it's not alien, you know, we used it back in. And that happened here, I mean, people from Germany and, and from continental Europe, you know, oh, yeah, we know what proportionality is, it's what we use back in the home country. So it's, you know, there are, when you start looking for it, there are, it's, it might not be as alien as it would immediately seem to many people because of those connections back to majority of countries in the world use a proportional system. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Now, Helen, did you have any particular questions that you wanted to ask? I, I do have a few questions. If yep, sure. um, I, something that's come up a lot is um, the economics of the no. 1980s and oh, world economics in particular. One, one thing, uh, just for continuity's sake, I know that Helen's asking the question. Look at you. Yeah. yeah how, how strong a correlation do you see between Reaganomics, Thatchernomics, and Wojnomics? Um, I think there's a lot of similarities between the three. The fun, I mean, fundamentally, the same set of beliefs between, behind the three. Do you think that uh, if it wasn't for Rogernomics, that MMP would have gotten passed? I, I mean, I know there there are some who believe that it was a protest against what had happened. I don't think. I think it played a part, but not a particularly big part. I think it would have happened anyway because of the arguments. I don't think it was primarily a reaction to the previous two governments. But I know there is a quite strong strand of belief that says it was just a reaction to the fourth Labour government. Mm. Um, there was, in 2005, there was the red and blue billboard campaign um, by National. Did you, and Iwi versus Kiwi seem to be the one that's mm sort of evoke the strongest feelings in people. Um, did, you, did you think, did you find the fact that there, were, that there was comparative advertising particularly interesting in the context of your role? Mm, no. I, I mean, it's, a, you know, it, it, it's not the first time that parties have uh, compared themselves to others. But I wasn't particularly surprised by it. Well, it, it just seems to me that you almost, even if you're pointing it in a negative light, you rarely ever campaign by mentioning what your opponent's policies are. Because people who agree with your opponent's policies will, you know, get bolstered by that. And it seemed to me an, an odd campaign. But, I mean, you, I, th I think all parties recognise that their opponents do have voters. And, I mean, there was a lot of talk about it being a dog whistle campaign. That the, what you read into those words depended on your predisposition anyway. Mm. And the, um, uh, when uh, there was a, oh, another art, uh, billboard very similar, tax cut, and then ACT came out with its own billboard which had the same words, tax cut, and then ACT on, on the end, now. Um, do you think that uh, the campaign by National, that very much Labour versus National campaign ignored that there were other parties in, in MMP, and do you think that hurt them? Um, when I said earlier that a lot of people, a lot of commentators have said that National ran a first past the post campaign, not an MMP campaign. That's partly what they are, you know, talking about. That by concentrating entirely on Labour, that they were running an old type campaign rather than an MMP campaign. Um, the the electoral finance bill, you had a key role with that. Are you able to sort of briefly? It's something that's come up a little bit from various people that we've talked to. Do you think you could sort of summarise that for us as briefly as you can? Yeah. Right, it's, you know. 
And uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be here for the next three years. Well, you know, just, just, just yeah. for the summer. It's 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 summary. Summer. There are three key things that the electoral finance bill does. One is that for the first time it regulates what third party campaigners do. So they now have to list if they want to spend over a certain amount of money and they have to put in, they're now under the same regulation as political parties and candidates, so they have to report on their donations and on how much they spend. So that's one of the key new things that happens, the parties are regulated. There's been a change in the donation regime, so that um, which donations parties, third parties and candidates have to report on is changed and there are now some restrictions on how much money can be um, given to parties, third parties and candidates in various forms, particularly anonymously and from overseas. And the third thing that's changed is some of the definitions about what an election campaign is. Um, some of that's just tidying up the wording and some of it's trying to um, future-proof. So the old regulations were written before people advertised on the internet and that's been taken care of. Um, yeah, so in that, in that third area, there's less fundamental change. Most of the fundamental change is that third parties are, are listed and regulated, and that donations have been increased regulation. And why, why is this a controversial legislation? Um, as much because of how it was done as because of what's in it. In that there wasn't, it wasn't based upon an independent review or cross-party agreement, which has been the norm on electron related changes in the past. Do you think it'll pass? Well, <coughs> I've seen a reason why it won't. I mean, it's got past its second reading. It would be a major shock, I think, if one of the parties that had voted through to the second reading now didn't vote through the third. Hmm. There's a question about money making a difference to, um, to campaigns. Do you... How, how big a difference does it make? I mean, the, we talked to some anarcho-capitalists from the Act Party who said... Um, but we've been campaigning for years and I haven't, we've gotten we're down to two. <laughs> um, how, what do you think? And oh, the other example, especially given the New Zealand scepticism, and I'm reminded of that Murray Ball cartoon where he's standing there going, the best reason to vote for MMP is to look at the people who are... Voting against it. Yeah. Um, I how mean, does that, what's that relationship? Um, in academic research, the only way that you can really study the impact of money is to look at referenda because... It's almost impossible to study the impact of money on elections because you can't remove the incumbency effect. So all of the studies of the impact on money on campaigning academically or on referenda where it's absolutely clear that money wins except on a few situations and is us winning, the you know, Electoral Reform Coalition winning the MP referendum here is one of the few examples where the side with the money didn't win. And mostly, you know, so mostly in referenda money wins unless they are defending the status quo on a constitutional type issue. So that might be a good example of when it doesn't win, but that's the only, that's the only place where there's good academic um, understanding of the impact of money. I've got three more questions, if that's okay. I'll go through them fast. Um, the, oh, this is sort of a question from our perspective. Um, will we have to consider the electoral finance bill when we are promoting our documentary about MMP? Only if you're going to suggest to people that they vote a particular way. Okay, we should be sweet then. Um, and you, uh, a, lot, a lot of people that we've spoken to, from large parties and small parties, have said that small parties do have a disproportionate amount of power in government, a lot of leverage. Do you see where they're coming from? It depends on what disproportionate means. Um, they are able to influence policy to a greater degree than what you would expect from the numbers that they have. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it all comes down to interpretations of what you think disproportionate is and how much influence you think people should have, whether you think um, numbers are everything. It's, you know, we don't know what happens inside negotiations. I don't think negotiations are a bad thing. Cool. Um, and you've mentioned that it's, you've done surveys before and after each election to assess the under, public understanding of MEP. Are those results available online or something that we can yes, access? Yes, they're all on the website. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we'll definitely look at those. That's everything from me, thank you. Uh, I did have a... Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much done too, but I was uh, wondering, uh, in, in this regard too, I, I noticed through there 
There's um, stills from a foot rots flat. Uh, yeah, those were the first. Those were the first. Edu those were the educate. Those are from the education ads that were run for the 1996 campaign. Uh, do you know if we could get a copy of those? I've been trying to look for them. I haven't found any uh, in the New Zealand Film Archive or anything like we that. We might. I'll talk to. Uh, I'll ask Peter if we've got copy or what state our copies of them are. If we've got copies. Yeah, because that was the the electoral commission did that responsible for them, so and in theory because, there should be copies of them somewhere. And, and because the electoral commission did them, oh, what's the status on copyright? Are they in public domain? I'd have or? to talk to Peter about Okay. I don't know. Because uh, we, we would like to use like an excerpt hmm. or something like that, if that's possible. Yeah, and they were, but I mean, they were good, and they were very popular, and people remember them. Mm. You know, I mean, they only ran for a couple of months, but people really remember them, partly because Foot Rock Flats don't have a lot of cachet here. Mm. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're kind of like uh, peanuts in the United yeah. States or something. Yeah. We found, oh, Brian found this cool thing on YouTube as well of John Cleese explaining yeah. anything for a British audience. STV. Yeah, ah, oh, sorry, STV, yeah. yeah. I, I thought, uh, no, I thought it was, uh, he was talking about proportional representation. He wasn't talking about STV or MMP. Uh, I think he did do a bit of STV. He flaps his wings and does the bat thing. It was done in the early 80s. Is that one? Right. I, I didn't find that one. He, but he was talking about proportional uh, And STV is a more proportional system. No. No? No. Um, why? why? Why isn't it proportional? Because it isn't designed to be proportional, it's accidentally proportional. Well, uh, it does, doesn't accidentally count? No, but it, it's not guaranteed. Ah. MNP and list proportionality is guaranteed to be proportional because the way that you turn votes into seats is based on proportionality. STV can work without political parties and therefore is not by design proportional. But um, it, would you say it's an improvement over FTP, first past the post? It depends on the situation. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Um, if it's all right with you, can we take a few shots just around the yeah, office sure. of the these things? Yeah. And your next <laughs> 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 Orange, orange, everyone.